Hi everybody, it's Jim from Sprague Wood Turning. This week I'm gonna make the nicest piece that I think I've ever made. This is the Peacock Holoform 3.0. Hopefully you enjoy the video. So it is time for Peacock Holoform 3.0. If you haven't seen the first two attempts at this, I would suggest you watch those. I think there's some interesting content there that you might get some information from. And what I'll do is I'll put all three of these into a playlist that you can find on my channel. So like the past, we're gonna use rainbow blue, emerald green, crystal purple, pearl gold, and Blue Laguna in this. So first things first, we're going to clean up this piece of maple burl. Get it cut to the right size to fit into our ice cream container. I'm going to use this again. This is actually a really good container. The one thing I like about it is that it's really flexible. So you can just pull it apart like this and then the casting just drops out. So hopefully this will be the last time <laughs> at this, but uh, well, that's all subject to, I don't know, subject to something. Let's get, um, let's get this cut on the bandsaw and then we'll go from there. I kind of want this piece to be half burl and half resin. So I'm just going to take a little bit of Gorilla Tape, stick that on here. Then we'll cut that off in the bandsaw. Some people might be wondering why I'm not using my circle cutting jig to do this. And sometimes I find it's just easier to stick the little template on the top. That way you can just follow that to get all those pieces that are not on the surface, if you will. And the other thing is it's really cold in my workshop, so I would have had to open the door to install it. And I just decided to do it that way. The other thing is we got to get rid of this bark so I'm just using a nice little pick tool that I've got and this actually the bark come off this quite easily. It's a good thing about burl that's cut in the summertime which I'm assuming this was that usually the bark doesn't stay on it when it comes time to run it through the kiln. Once the majority of the bark is gone then I just switch over to this brass brush that's in my drill. You'll also see me use a handheld one as well and it's you know I find it's the best way to get down between those little spikes and nubs to get, make sure that all the bark is gone. And then of course do a good job blowing it all out so that you don't get any floaty bits in your resin. How awesome are those spikes? All right, so what we're going to do now is uh, I'm going to wait till 6 p.m. and then we'll come out and mix up the resin. But what I'm going to do is measure this by volume and I'm going to use the rice method again. But now we know the correct way how to do this and I'll show you. All right, so I've poured the rice in here and I've kind of shook it all around and made sure it went down around the sides and into as many areas as I can get it. And then I put one inch of resin on the top of this for this piece to pull from as it cures. So let's dump this out and measure it. And then whatever this is, we'll add 40% to it and that should give us the correct level of resin. The 40% comes from all the spacing between the rice. I think it was Scott sent me an email explaining all this. And uh, sorry if it wasn't. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll, if it isn't, I'll, I'll, I'll correct that later on. All right, so let's dump this out and measure this by volume. And then we'll see how much uh, resin we need to mix up. So 
So there's two liters right there. And there's another liter. All right, so you know, three liters of resin is a lot of resin. <laughs> and 40% of that would be, I don't know, 1.25 liters of resin. So uh, 3.25 liters is, would technically probably do it, but I think that's too much. And the reason why I think it's too much is because this is a good solid burl and I don't think that it's really gonna absorb a whole lot. And the other thing too is the resin's gonna be more in a cured state, so it's probably not gonna get the opportunity to penetrate into this like it ordinarily would be. So, you know, I think that I'm gonna drop that down to about three and three, yeah, 3.75 liters, somewhere around there four liters I don't know but you know it's 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 a real guessing game when it comes to wood and how much it's going to absorb and how many voids there are and you know there's a few little voids here too so you know I don't want to certainly see this thermal crack so I'm going to err on the side of caution and you know I'm just going to mix up probably four liters and that should be lots for what we want to do and um yeah Anyway, go ahead and share your thoughts. We'll see you guys at 6 o'clock. We'll mix up some resin, and we'll get this party started. This week, we're going to be using deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy. And so I could have left the epoxy in the two containers that you see here. You'll see me split it up into an additional three containers. And the reason for that is... I want it, this epoxy all to kind of cure at the same uh, same rate, but the problem is I didn't want the epoxy to be thick and then try and mix the pigments into it because that probably would have introduced a lot of air and I didn't really want to go down that road with this. So I decided to mix it now when the epoxy is very liquidy. That will allow all those all the air bubbles to escape prior to doing the pour. Ideally, you know, you all the epoxy would be the same sort of cured state when it comes to casting it and pouring it together. But I didn't see any other option of doing it. By all means, if you have a, a solution to this, let me know in the comments. All right, so there's our five colors. Uh, the last one was about, so there's about three, three liters and three quarters. Uh, just it's since it's two to one it's easier to measure out a half and then add another quarter of a liter to it so there's 3.75 liters of resin here so what I'm going to do is put these in my clean room where there's heat the thermostat set at 70 and we will carry on with this tomorrow night night all right so here is an update uh, I came out here at nine o'clock this morning so that would have been 15 hours after mixing and the resin was still very, very liquidy. Now this has thickened up. The smaller volumes haven't thickened up as much as the larger volumes. So, you know, that there is getting pretty close that we're probably gonna have to pour it soon. I don't know, I'll have to really watch it. So when I come out here at nine o'clock, I should back this up a bit. When I put this in the in the room last night here, the thermostat was set at 70 degrees. At the 15 hour mark, still very liquidy. I bumped the temperature up to 75, and that has really made a difference in how thick this is. And you know, there's a remarkable difference between these two large resin volumes than there is with this. You can see how easily it comes off the stick and how quickly it does. So I'm going to give this maybe, <laughs> I'm going to give this maybe another hour max, and then we're probably going to have to pour it. So, you know, it is now noon. So that is 18 hours after the pour. And uh, it's still, you know, <laughs> it's remarkably still pliable. So, you know, that this is one of the great things about deep cast. If there is any bubbles in the work, 
I, there's some bubbles in this just because I've been playing with it a little bit. It allows all those bubbles to escape so you don't end up with a lot of bubbles in your work. And of course that allows the resin to really penetrate into the pieces that you're working with as well. That way you don't have any delamination issues. So uh, we're still in a holding pattern. We'll probably see you in about another hour. All right, well, we are at the 19 hour mark. So if you're curious, these big uh, resin pours here, this is 34 and a half. 33 and a half and these smaller ones a little over 24 25 25 2 so that's in Celsius uh, I mean it's really starting to thicken up so I think that we really got no choice but to do this now and before I used a syringe and injected it I'm not going to do that this time. What I'm going to do is just simply pour it in in layers and then maybe I might just take the stir stick and go in a couple times and that's it. Off camera I glued this with hot melt glue on the bottom. I don't want to rock on the top because if the resin does stay higher than this then hopefully we'll be able to incorporate that into the piece. Uh, yeah I guess that's it. We need to Get this poured. Yeah, this is definitely a lot thicker trying to clean this off the stick for sure. So the other encouraging thing is when I went out and when I filmed this an hour ago to tell you about the time, wait times, like this hasn't moved. It's still. So hopefully that will stay the same when it's all mixed together. The other thing that I've done this on 3.0 is that I mix the emerald green and the rainbow blue uh, in equal volumes. I, you know, I predominantly in the past I had the two other ones. Blue was the was the dominant color, but you know, after looking more closely at a peacock, I guess it's it's easy to see that it's probably both. So that's why I mixed the two main colors like that and of course the three other colors they're just accent colors like you would see in the feathers of the peacock and if you work with deep cast before you know that it is a lot thinner than this so you know i've never had to struggle to get resin out of the bucket so that that's kind of where the the cure state of this resin needs to be before you attempt something like this. If you if you do it any other way, then in all likelihood, the colors are all going to blend together like we've seen in the first two peacock holoforms. But, you know, don't get me wrong. Those those two other holoforms that I did were absolutely beautiful as well. But it wasn't really what I was going for. And this is the only way that I think you can achieve it. But by all means, if you've uh, been able to achieve these same results, I would love to hear how you did it. Hey, <laughs> there's people in there saying, don't do it, Jim. Well, I'm going to, because I, I don't want this to look like this. I want it to blend together a little better than this. There, I'm not gonna fool with it anymore. Stop yelling at me. It'd be interesting to see when we open the pressure pot if that pattern is still sitting on the very top. So since this has been like almost a day, I'm assuming that in a couple of days, this should be uh, ready to, to turn. I'm gonna get this in the pressure pot and we'll see you then. Well, this is what success looks like. <laughs> uh, wow, it's been a long journey getting here, but anyway, uh, the color separation is awesome. I'm seeing a lot of bubbles on the surface here, and I'm hoping that they're just near the top and not deep down inside the casting. But, you know, just kind of running that stir stick through there, 
may have introduced some bubbles down in there. So, you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge if, if, if we need to. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm really, really happy with the way this looks. The other concern is that I'm hoping that any of the voids that are down inside of this got filled as well. But, again, yet this resin was so thick when it went in, we may have to deal with that as well. All right, let's get this out and then have a look at it. Hmm. Beauty. Wow. You see the glue points? Well, sir, well, sir, I love the look of that. All right, got one center there. Get it on leave. A number of people have commented that, you know, it's it's really all about the wait time. And, you know, now I'm seeing that that is definitely it. And, you know, I, I, I kind of knew that anyway. But the one thing that's really kind of something that you can maybe work with is the temperature. So, you know, if you've got really large volumes of, of epoxy, I, when that stopped, I was like, oh, yeah, that's like really super awesome. And anyway, you know, you can hear there's a lot of chatter and this piece was really out of balance. The burl was predominantly only on one side and of course the resin was on the other and it made it really kind of out of balance and really I could only achieve just a little bit over 300 RPM. So it was um, it was a little slow turning than normal. Uh, but anyway, getting back to temperature, in the past I've put pieces in the fridge to cool down the, 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 the curing process to prevent things from thermal cracking. And you know, so I knew that temperature was certainly could work in my favor as far as casting this is concerned the um but you know really the the temperature is the key i think that if you can boost up the temperature maybe you might be able to um cast this sooner than 19 hours but you know you you, you basically run the risk that if you're not watching it like a hawk that you know it could certainly go off and and that's it it's going to set up on you and you're going to lose four liters of resin which we certainly don't want to do if you're new to my channel thanks for stopping in hopefully you've subscribed the tool that i'm using is the hercules it is the number three hercules from hunter tool systems and there is a link in the description if you would like to get one of these just use code inlay gym at checkout and you'll get 10% off your order and uh, anyway they have more a lot more tools than this Mike Hunter is a great guy check out 100 tools if you need any tools for turning a couple of people have actually recently in comments have asked you know why don't I put a glue block on right away and you know I have in the past but you know until I get all of that outer casting resin stripped off, sometimes I don't really know which is going to be the top and which is going to be the bottom. So, you know, I, I prefer to remove all of the excess resin and then stand back and look at a piece and go, okay, this is going to be the bottom. This is going to be the top. I know that it's, it's actually been asked a, a number of times why I don't do it. And the other thing too, is I really do prefer to stick the hot milk glue to wood and not the resin. As long as you give the resin a good uh, tooth for it to bind to it, it probably isn't that big of a deal. But I do prefer to stick it to wood over resin. So after looking at the piece, I've determined that this is in fact going to be the bottom. One thing that really surprised me when I stuck that stir stick in there after I put all the resin in, I thought for sure that this piece was going to be loaded with bubbles and you know what it's not 
there was one tiny little bubble that's left on the surface of where the resin is and, and that's it i didn't really i was really really surprised by this because i i thought that it was possibly going to be an issue and you know I, at this stage i'm really still kind of figuring out exactly when i what form i want to go with uh, i want to do something that we haven't done yet and eventually i kind of come up with this this form and you know I'm, I'm happy that i went in this direction i think it really shows off the resin quite well there's what happens when you're too aggressive this resin is fully cured and <laughs> it it's not really that big of a deal right now but if if you're working on resin pieces like this and you're too aggressive and you're almost down to your finished dimension and then you get that massive amount of chip out and you don't have the room to repair it, then you may just ruin your project. So as you're coming up near the top, like I soon will be, if you slow down your tool feed rate, it will help prevent that chip out. Well, what do we think about the resin so far? This is, this is probably the best resin I've ever done. I think, uh, I think I'm going to make that call right now. <laughs> uh, it is just absolutely gorgeous with tons of different colors in it. Really, really digging it for sure. So, you know, I think I'm going to take a few more sweeping cuts down in here. I'm not going to turn this into like a Southwest style type hollow form, but it's going to, there's going to be maybe some elements of that. But, um, you know, you need to level out the resin here yet. And I'll flatten this on the top, and then I'll make a decision if I'm going to keep this or not. Really undecided. What would you have done? That's the question. I really like getting people involved that watch my videos. Uh, you know, I, you'll see me ask you questions throughout the the video here, and you know, like I'm, I'm being genuine when I'm asking these questions because I'm I'm really curious to see where people sit with items such as this and you know it sometimes surprises people that you know when i cast things i don't really know what shape i'm going for but that's just the way i am this is another common question why do i put glue blocks on the bottom of these pieces and my answer to that is if you don't put a glue block on the bottom of this piece then you're going to actually lose a good solid probably three quarters of an inch off the overall height of it. So in my mind, it doesn't make any sense to do that and to use a glue block. I also use the Cutsall Sander and that gives the bottom of this piece a really good tooth for the hot melt glue to stick to as well. So again, you know, this is kind of an out of balance piece. So you want to make sure that you've got really good adhesion with the glue block so you don't have any problems. So now that the casting is secured in the chuck, we'll be able to take some more just final cuts to get it back into balance. And then it uh, won't be long before we'll be able to move on to hollowing. Still got to figure out this top. So I'm just going to let this play for a little while, and I'll talk to you here in a minute. So this could be a solution to the problem. Uh, I mean, it's not really a problem. I could just take it off. But you know, I really think that I want to try and incorporate this some way. And I thought, you know, if I did a bead at the top here, and then the, the, the wood is kind of tucked underneath of it, that it would look more natural and planned that way, if you will. Maybe the solution is to come in and do one of these numbers like this. That may look good as well. 
and then that way but I mean I think you're gonna see this certainly better than you see it now this I don't know it looks like it should have a lid on it I don't want this to look like an urn I want this to look like a very viable piece of art which it hopefully will be so you know I don't know <laughs> it's um, it's toss-up it really is uh, my mind is telling me to take this off and cut that resin off and just finish with the wood on the top but you know my my the artistic side of my brain is saying no no you need to incorporate this somehow this resin is too beautiful to lose what do you think I don't know I'm gonna sleep on it overnight um, man I tell you I got more snow to move it just hasn't stopped here it's crazy we got to have darn near three feet of snow now. So that's what I'm doing. See you tomorrow. So I've had a night to think on this and I think that I'm for the most part going to leave this the way that it is. I'm going to define this more into a bead, try and tuck this little straight piece of burl underneath of that. So, you know, it's, it doesn't really play a factor in it really. This is a shape that we haven't done before here, so that's another reason to leave this. So that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, again, it's just a shape that we haven't done before, so I think that it's gonna be, need, uh, gonna be neat. And I think we're just gonna bead this more over, and then we'll be able to um, do the inside. Anyway, share your thoughts. You know, I know better than that. I don't know why I did that. So that's exactly what happens when you present the tool to the work at the wrong angle. I get that kickback and you know, I know better. I should have been using that more like a scraper. The, the resin performs better as a scraper. So when you're using that scoochy gouge, but uh, anyway, it was large enough that I was able to, to salvage the piece and um, I'm glad that I had enough there to, to correct that because I would have been really kind of bummed out if I had to cut that resin off. That was a spear point tool that I was using by Richard Raffin in the previous clip. It's good. I, I just want it to really kind of tuck that burl up underneath of the bead and that spear point tool actually work pretty good in that regard there for the most part that is tucked underneath there and you don't even know it's there anymore all right uh, yeah you know you got this resin because this stuff is pretty much fully cured is very brittle so you got to be really really careful with your tool work or else you're gonna have a massive blow like I did there all right let's uh, get the drill bits into this to drill this piece out, I used the 1 and 1 16th. Don't ask me why I used that. It was just laying around. And then I think I used the 2 and a quarter. We're all set up, ready for hollowing. This is the one-way captive system. There is a laser on it. Point it right at the very end of the cutter. Very robust system, really like it, especially since I'm left-handed. Got my steady rest in. Anyway, we'll get in, clean this out as much as we can. I've got an extension unit that goes onto this. I don't think we're gonna be able to do the whole form with that. But I do like using this big boring bar because it's very robust and doesn't tend to vibrate as much as the thinner bars do. All right, let's get this beauty hollowed out. To remove the inside of the hollow form, I 
for the most part stuck with this large boring bar about three quarters of it i do have to switch to a different knife profile because i just couldn't get to the outer reaches of it and uh, but you'll see that coming up along with the extension that goes on to this boring bar i'm kind of curious as to what systems people are using captive systems uh pros and cons what you like about it what you don't and uh be interesting to see what the majority of people are using thought i'd give you a little update that's what it looks like inside so far still pretty rough in some areas i'm going to put a little extension on my cutter here and hopefully we'll be able to get the rest of this we won't have to switch out to the thinner boring bars Pretty burl down in there, I'll tell you that. You might be able to see that, I don't know, maybe not. That resin's taking quite a battering though. Uh, that resin being fully cured is really, really hard. So I think we can probably expect more of this. Uh, I'll probably try and take more finesse cuts as we get further out towards the sidewall. But uh, yeah, hopefully we can sort that out because it's chipped up pretty good. There's a little extension that goes on to this boring bar. So, you know, as I work my way to the outside wall of this piece, I'm probably a little more aggressive than I should be. And that's why the, the resin chip out is as bad as it is. If, again, it's all about feed rate and slowing down the cutter. And if you do that, then, of course, you're not going to have near as much uh, resin chip out as you've seen there in that last uh, little clip. All right, I've switched out to this boring bar. It's certainly not as robust, so we might see a little bit of movement in it. And that's where the laser is set up at. I don't know, it's probably five eighths of an inch, somewhere around there. All right, let's see if we can finish it off with this. The only real benefit, other than the fact that you can get to the outside, the outside wall with this, is that it has a smaller surface area and it glides better on the tool rest. So that's one bonus about these thinner boring bars that I actually really like. Uh, again, I did put some paste wax, some min wax paste wax on the tool rest and the retaining bars at the back. And after doing that, the piece really seems to glide around really nicely. Along with that, the cutter that goes on the end of these these bars here is actually smaller so it tends to not be as grabby so that's another bonus uh using the bent knife system here from one way the laser was hitting the very top of the steady wrist so that's why i'm measuring this manually and uh, there's nothing wrong with measuring manually <laughs> but the laser sure is nice All right, I'll show you the inside here in a sec. We're all done. Uh, the uh, the laser holder keeps hitting on this, so I had to go basically blind in this area right here. I could use it on either side of this. So, you know, I've been talking about modifying this, and I've got to. I'm going to cut this off on the other side as well and basically raise it up into a square and then readjust these so that the laser doesn't hit on it. It's becoming a real pain. Uh, anyway, I gotta stop talking about it and do it. 
So there's what we're looking at inside. It's not too bad. Fairly pleased with that actually. Not a lot of tear out, that's for sure, or chip out if you will. But um, pretty tough getting here. But anyway, I'm gonna do a resin finish on the inside of this. So let's get this sanded up and then uh, we'll be able to sand up the outside and get the first coat of fish on. These are the three and a half inch double discs from sandpaper.ca and I'm using a two inch disc holder. If you're curious, that allows the sandpaper to wrap around it and you're able to do some really good sanding with that. Just couldn't do the very top. So rolled up some sandpaper, used a stick to try and get in there just to smooth things out. There was just one little ridge that was really bothering me. So I really wanted to try to get rid of that. I think I'm going to get one of those sanding gloves. If you've got one of those sanding gloves and you can give me a recommendation on which one you have. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a glove that's got basically Velcro on it and you can stick these discs on it and get your hands in there and, and do that sanding manually. Uh, anyway, I would appreciate your recommendation on that because I've actually never seen one and I've never owned one. As per normal, the piece was sanded from 60 to 800 on the outside. On the inside, I actually only went to 220, I think it was, or 180 because I plan on doing a resin finish. That is the Triple E buffing compound from the BL buffing system. And the last thing that we have to do is just clean that off with some denatured alcohol before we can put our first coat of finish on. The absolute best part. So the plan is to actually do a resin coat finish in here. But, you know, I'm dying to see what this looks like with coat finish on it. So I'm going to do the outside first. And we're going to be using Waterlux Gloss. Well, there you have it folks look at that I'm gonna make the call right now that this is the best resin I've ever done and it's probably the nicest piece that I've ever done crazy peacock colors there's a cool little area right there too burl is spectacular nice burl eyes just a beauty piece. All right, well, we will see you tomorrow for the second coat. I'm going to be using the art cast for the inside of this piece. And you know, I really like art cast. It will cure overnight and that way it doesn't affect any finishing the, the next day. So that's why I prefer to use the art cast. Super crystal clear too. All right, so what I have here is four ounces of the art cast, and I'm just going to dump it in here, swish it all around, and then I'll flip it upside down on top of this so it catches the resin. Uh, I really wanted to get another coat on today on the outside, but I think it's probably best to at least seal up the inside first before we move forward. And I'm sure this is more than enough. There, I'll just leave that upside down for about 10 minutes or so. Then I'll flip it over and I'll burn the bubbles off on the inside of it. It's probably going to need two coats on the inside, I'm assuming, but we'll have to see. Typically, unsealed wood with resin will really give a lot of bubbles off. By the way, I'll bring it back when we're ready to do that and we'll see what it looks like anyway. All right, that's been 10 minutes, so I think that's long enough. Don't want this to run down the side of this hull form. There's a few little bubbles in there, but for the most part, it's not too bad at all. Let's fire up the torch. One of these days I am going to try the alcohol spraying method.
but uh, I don't have a spray bottle for it. I don't know if that would work down inside of here or not either. All right, well, that's it. That's a quick one today. We'll see you tomorrow for the second coat. Beautiful. This is the next day, and just like always, I use Triple E buffing compound between each coat, and that knocks the finish down. It takes any lumps and bumps out of it. I wasn't able to get inside of it, so I used the 6O steel wool, and then clean it up with the alcohol. Good morning, people. This is the second coat of Waterlux Gloss. And I'm hoping I'm thinking that this should be it. One of the benefits of using the gloss is that it really covers nicely. How about that? Wow. And as you can see down inside, there's no bubbles either. So that's awesome. One coat of finish on the inside. It's a little hard to see. That area is pretty cool. Beautiful burl. Another area there, it's pretty neat. Wow. If they could all be this nice. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, we'll see you tomorrow when we're doing the foot. Here I'm using my one-way vacuum chuck system. It takes took a little bit to get this lined up. Uh, if you're in board, of course, you can do things differently. But outboard, you have to just eyeball it until you can get it running true. Just took the waste block off with the bowl gouge from David Ellsworth, the 5 8 bowl gouge. And then I started sanding the bottom at 120 and I went all the way to 320. I didn't see any need to go any higher than that since there's no resin. I also decided to use the spear point tool again just to put a little groove in the very bottom of this piece just to dress it up slightly. Let's finish this video up. <laughs> well, it was a journey getting here, but man, is this thing beautiful. By far the best resin I have ever done. The wait time when you're using the deep cast is the key to this. Here is the very bottom. I know that I didn't show that on here. Still needs probably three coats to finish on the very bottom. Uh, this piece ended up being eight inches across and six inches tall and it is absolutely beautiful. That burl is pretty amazing looking stuff. I will again put some photos or some video at the end with it being lit from above. Uh, it should look pretty cool when it's all lit up. Just, you know, <laughs> it was a journey getting here folks. I'm telling you, it was, it certainly was. And like I said, I will put all three of these videos into a playlist. That way, if you haven't seen the other two, you'll be able to see them. Here's the inside. It actually worked out quite nicely as well. You can feel, if you stick your hands and you can feel just a tiny little ridge there at the very top, but you know, it's inside and it, you know, for the most part, really doesn't matter. But, uh, you know, awesome, awesome piece. Uh, with this resin block being on that one side though, it was really hard to turn. Uh, Geez, probably, I don't think I was a little over 300. It's all I could do with this or else the lathe, there was just too much shaking. But, you know, it is a beautiful piece and it is for sale. And, you know, like I said, I think that this is probably the nicest thing that I've ever made. So if anybody's interested in it, please send an email to spraggwoodturning at gmail.com and I will disclose the price to you. But I do warn you that it, uh, it will not be cheap. I will tell you that right now. Um... Yeah, I mean, I finally did. I mean, the uh, I'm gonna set this down before I drop it. 
I think that really the key to a lot of things is the heat. So curing that resin, you know, 70 to 75 degrees is what designer epoxy wants for their resin to cure. So, you know, if you kind of play with that temperature, if you lower that temperature, I believe that you're going to get a longer open time with the resin. And of course, if you increase the temperature, I think that it's probably going to cure faster. Anyway, that's kind of been my observation with it. I don't know if humidity plays a fact in this. Maybe Designer Epoxy can chime in in the comments. I just, I don't really know enough about epoxy resin to, to say yay or nay, but maybe it does, I don't know. But I do know that, you know, the 19 hours and bumping that temperature just up five degrees really started to thicken up that epoxy. And that was how we achieved all that color separation. So um, again, you know, in the future, we'll do more projects like this. Uh, there's no way that you can get away with a, um, a fast curing epoxy. It would just completely thermal crack, especially, I don't know, what was that, four liters, something like that. So, you know, that is a lot of epoxy and you have to use a deep casting epoxy or else you're gonna run into all kinds of issues. All right, so next week, we're gonna be doing something cool again. Uh, I don't know if we'll be at 85,000 or not, but anyway, I, we certainly probably will be at the week after that. So it's a very, very large cookie. I'll just leave it at that. So please come on back and see that. Don't forget to put designer epoxy by itself in the, in the comments down below to be entered into the three gallon giveaway at 90,000. So uh, geez, we're almost halfway there. So thanks again for designer epoxy for sponsoring that. And of course, all the other sponsors of my channel are in the description down below. And if you need some stuff, go down there, check them out, put some money back in your pocket. All right, well, that's it. Take care, stay safe. Don't forget the bell. Please share my videos with your friends. We'll see you next week. Take care.